Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... I said I wouldn't do this again, but I am doing another TBR pile, and this is so I can hopefully just go on and push myself forward and read some books that I have really been wanting to revisit and also try out. So, yeah. The last time I did a TBR video, I expected it would be done within maybe a year, but no, about two, three years later, I was still reading on it, which granted, it was a pretty big list to start with, but also, I'm a mood reader, so I did deviate from that TBR pile just to enjoy things that were seasonal. And... Yeah, I did it again. I collected a large rack full of books that I really want to read and really want to revisit. So this is just going to be a mix of books that were recommended to me and books that I have dearly been wanting to read. So without me rambling on, let's see what I'm about to dedicate myself to for probably the next couple of years. So in no particular order, First up is The Witching Hour by Anne Rice. Now, my good friend Tammy had requested I review this. It's one of her favorite books, and she claims she's read it over 50 times, which, judging by the size, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to doubt you, Tammy. I know you like to read fast, and I know you read a lot, so I'm not doubting you. But I read this when I was in junior high and absolutely loved it. Uh, the first time it had ever been introduced to me was when I used to visit my Aunt Carrie, rest in peace, and we would talk about books, and she would always encourage my reading habits, and she said that if I had never read Anne Rice before, which at that time I hadn't, I needed to start with The Witching Hour because I could literally smell the magnolias and the flowers just come right off of the page, and that's very true. The descriptions in this book are so vivid, it makes you feel like you are on the streets of New Orleans. But also, at the same time, this book chronicles the lives of the Mayfair witches. And I don't really want to reveal too much, except it just blows your mind at the end. Or at least it blew my mind at the end. And I haven't seen the TV show. I'm not necessarily certain that I want to because I already have in mind how the author intended everything to appear. Plus, they cut out one of the major characters. So, yeah. But, yeah. Right now, uh, my husband is reading this. I blabbed to him about how good it is. So, those are his post-its. He cannot stop talking about it. And I am currently buddy reading this with a group of friends, so expect a review on this one soon. Alright, so if I'm going to read and review The Witching Hour, I've got to read and review the sequel. And, of course, I've read this one before as well. I read it as soon as I had finished reading The Witching Hour back in the day. And this is the sequel called Lasher, which we gain the whole backstory about the antagonist known as Lasher. And let me put it like this, I, there's just so much to this. I can't really say a lot, but it definitely makes you feel a little bit more for this character, and it makes you kind of understand this character a little bit more. I really don't remember too much about the sequel as uh, much as what I remember about the first book, but I do remember that this was a really great follow-up. And for the final Anne Rice book of this year is Taltos. Now, this is going to be the third part of the Mayfair Witch series, and of course Taltos is the name of one of the characters. Not really going to spoil anything for you, but just know this series is very witchy, very supernatural, and one of the many things I love about it is how involved the Talamasca is with everything, which I honestly wish Anne Rice would have just written this huge Case Files book on the Talamasca, have it something like 
I don't know, X-Files or something like that, but just have it all Talamasca based. So yeah, this one I remember a little less about. I don't know why I don't remember more about it. Um, but out of the three, The Witching Hour totally made the biggest impression, and the other two, even though I do remember the key points, I can't wait to revisit this one, especially because there's just so much that my brain forgot. And yeah, obviously I'm going to try to knock out the reviews for the trilogy here, just one right after another. But if I see that it's taking me a little too long, because these are all pretty thick books, I'm probably going to do just a few small videos in between, like maybe reviews on smaller books. But these are what I am going to start the year off with, or at least attempt to start the year off with. Next up is another horror book that I read when I was in junior high, which this is The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. Now, this is something that I remember reading and thinking to myself, wow, the movie did a really great job of adapting the book, but very much like The Witching Hour, I read it as a surface read and my brain really wasn't trained to see different themes or, you know, metaphors or anything like that during that age. It was more so just, ooh, horror, I'm gonna love this, which of course I did. But I think that I'm probably going to say about the same things in regards to this book as I would about the movie because they were so very similar. And once again, this is something that my Aunt Carrie and I spoke of. As a matter of fact, when she passed away, I ended up getting her edition of The Exorcist. And this one, it still smells like her. It it smells like cigarettes and just a dusty old house, and it's something I'll never give up. And, of course, the pages are all yellowed and stuff like that, so yeah, this, this isn't worth a penny. It's like a book club edition, but it's worth the world to me because it's something she and I enjoyed together. So, yeah... I'm kind of seeing where some of the books I'm grabbing are sentimental in regards to revisiting them. I really didn't realize that the first few books I'd be featuring on here were books that my Anne and I read together until I just sat down and turned on the camera. But yeah, I feel like this is going to be a very fun read. I can't wait to revisit it and just share my thoughts about how iconic it truly is. Following that is Ghoul by Michael Slade. Now last year, my good online friend Hanny had told me about the first book in this series called Headhunter, and she said it blew her mind and she wanted to revisit it, so we read it together, and while I went into this knowing it was a serial killer story that was also in the splatterpunk subgenre, I honestly didn't know what to expect. And the end result was something that felt like crime noir, but also at the same time, it felt like it was paying its respects to the slasher subgenre. And it honestly reminded me of what would happen if, like, something along the lines of Silence of the Lambs happened in Canada. And even though there were times in the first book where I felt like it was disjointed and I was like, where in the hell is this going? How is this significant? When I got to the end of that book, my mind was blown because I was like, I can't believe all this fit together. It's like I just received a whole family history of a serial killer, which I had never seen it constructed in that way before. So that was really cool. And since the serial killer was taken care of in the first book, I'm imagining that we are probably going to see the same police or the Mounties in this book, but we're probably going to be focused on a different serial killer. And if this is anything like Headhunter, I know I'm in for a treat. So even though my husband hasn't read this book, he's recommended that he and I read it together because he's a fan of the movie adaptation, which I've yet to see, but he's explained even though he did enjoy the movie, he still does not understand what exactly happened. And for that reason, he's hoping we can put our heads together and read the book and try to solve the mystery. 
Now, I really don't know what to expect of I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. I have heard that it is really trippy. I'm kind of thinking in the line of David Lynch or David Cronenberg, maybe even Mark Z. Danielewski, who did House of Leaves. I just really don't know what to expect of this, except it's about a guy who brings his girlfriend home to meet the family, and she's thinking about dumping him. And I'm sure it's going to take a hard left turn some way, somehow, but yeah, I am ready to try this out. I know it's not going to be an easy read. I've already psyched myself out for it, so here's to hoping. Up next is The Local Truth by Carlos E. Rivera. And this is the first book of the White Harbor Trilogy, or what I believe is going to be a trilogy. I don't think it's going to be anything more than just three books. But from my understanding, this is a LGBTQ plus cosmic horror story about a small town that has a dark secret, which of course, it's a cult. We have a cult worshipping a god, which I imagine to be an elder god. And with this, there comes, of course, a sacrifice. And I'm getting some strong Lovecraft vibes with this book. I'm not necessarily certain if that was an inspiration for the author or not, but I definitely love cosmic horror, I love cults, and I love the supernatural. So this is hitting in all the right places, and I'm hoping that I can read this and go straight from this book to the sequel when it's released. So yeah, hopefully that can happen and I can just go from book to book while having a fresh memory. And I believe the third book is going to be released next year. Not too certain on that. Another sequel on this list is The Scarlet Gospels by Clive Barker. Now, a couple of years ago, Hanny, Connie, Carrie, and my niece Abby and I, we all buddy read the first book, which is The Hellbound Heart. And for those of you who don't know, that's the book that inspired the movie Hellraiser with, of course, Pinhead. And we thoroughly enjoyed the book. We felt like it was full of so much information that the movie just couldn't cover. And the weird thing is, it was like really a tiny book. Like, the book's maybe about that big, but we gained so much information out of it. And we felt like it was really a good comment on, like, just religion in general. And it was very, very creepy and unsettling. Of course, Barker is very visual with his descriptions. Uh, he is very relentless, and I don't really know what to expect with the sequel here, except I know that one of his famous detectives goes up against Pinhead. So, yeah, I can't wait to read this baby. If you haven't read the first book, I highly recommend that you do. And if you want to see my review for the first book, I have the Hellbound Heart video in my video lineup. So, yeah, be sure to check that one out. Okay, this is a book that I've wanted to read ever since I was a child, and I don't know why I never read it. And this is probably going to be one of those circumstances where after I read it, I'm going to kick myself in the ass because it's going to be something where I'm like, yeah, you so totally should have read it when it first was released. Which, when this was first released, it wasn't released as an entire book, but it was released as a serial. And I think each of the books were like maybe a hundred or so pages long. I can't remember. But I'm talking about the Blackstone Chronicles by John Saul. Now, I don't really know what to expect of this. I remember seeing the covers back when I was a kid and thinking that they looked badass. And also, I was a huge John Saul fan as a kid. Like, I remember there were many a summer days that I would just lay in my room and read everything that I could get my hands on by him, but obviously not this series. And I just remember thinking, wow, these are so fun and creepy and I could relate to the characters. And I do need to read and review more John Saul. I don't know why I haven't, but he is definitely an author where if you love paranormal fiction, 
you will most likely love him. And I'm kind of thinking this might be something like that TV show Friday the 13th, where we have cursed antiques or something along that line. But yeah, this is going to be fun. I'm going to be so excited when I finally crack it open. And I'm thinking about maybe doing that this summer simply just to bring back feelings of nostalgia of when I would spend my summer reading John Saul. So yeah, this is going to happen soon. Following that is a book whose author everybody knows, but I never really hear anyone speak about this particular piece, and that is Fever Dream by George R. R. Martin. Now, this came to me wrapped in plastic. It's not a first edition or anything like that, but it is the book club edition, and since I love this cover, I'm just not going to take it out of the plastic. But I am hoping to read this this summer with an old classmate of mine named Andrea, which this will be the first time that we will have buddy read anything together. And while I'm really not too certain what to expect with this, from my understanding, it regards a steamboat captain who is obsessed with immortality. And of course, he's going down the Mississippi River, which... You know, I live in Mississippi, so I'm going to see if there's any nods to my state, especially since he's traveling our river. But I'm kind of gathering the idea that this is going to be like what would happen if Interview with the Vampire met Tom Sawyer. I don't know. I could be wrong on that. But I am very interested to start this read. And continuing forward with vintage books, this is a movie that I've seen, but I've honestly never read the book before, and that is The Stepford Wives by Ira Levin. And of course, everyone knows this is the concept of men being able to gain the perfect wife, which I believe the grand reveal is, if the book is anything like the movie I'd seen, that the only way to do that is to turn your wife into a robot. And I feel like I'm going to gain a lot of social commentary with this book. I feel like it's definitely going to speak about women's rights a great deal. And even though the movie never scared me, I'm kind of thinking the book might be a little bit different. I'm not too certain. But yeah, of course, when I found this original hardback copy, I had to grab it. It's not anything that special. It's just a book club edition. But still, if you can get something that looks vintage and it's in good shape, go for it while you can. Up next is a book that I think is totally going to be a fun read. I don't think it's going to be scary or creepy. It could be gross, but it definitely sounds interesting, which this is Pearl by Josh Mailerman. Now, I've never read any of Mailerman's longer pieces, but I have read a few of his short stories, which I have enjoyed. And this is, from my understanding, a story that takes place on a farm, and there's a pig on that farm named Pearl that has telepathy. And it can get inside of the head of any human being that's nearby, and it can cause that human being to kill on its behalf. So, yeah, that sounds really trippy, and... I really am looking forward to just how batshit crazy this book is going to be. While speaking of animals, I have next up being... I hope I say this name correctly. I'm going to try my darndest. But Tinder is the Flesh by Augusta Bazterica. I, I hope I said that correctly. I have heard a lot of people say this was a very disturbing book. Uh, I believe it is supposed to be a comment on the meat industry and promoting vegetarianism, so on and so forth, but I believe this is a book about cannibalism, and I don't know what to expect except that it fits into the cannibalism subgenre, so I haven't read too many of those books, but I am looking forward to diving into that subgenre a little bit more. Following that is a manga that has highly been recommended to me by my husband 
and the TikToker known as Reverend Sid Kane. And this is No Longer Human by Junji Ito. I have no idea what to expect with this book, except it's supposed to be depressing as hell, like not one single good thing happens in it. And I know Junji Ito normally deals with body horror. I don't know if this is a book about body horror, but I have heard it's really a wild ride. I love his other mangas. And this is something I'm really thinking is going to gross me out because for the majority of it, his work is very grotesque and it is very far out there in left field. So I know this is not going to disappoint. Next up is a book that I'm sure is going to be disturbing. And while I've heard that it fits more into the suspense category, suspense can also be pretty horrific, especially since this was inspired by an actual event. But next up is The Devil of Nanking by Mo Hader. And I don't really know what to expect. I haven't looked into it too much, but it seems like this is going to be a story about a woman who's interested in obtaining a portion of film that regards the massacre that happened at Nanking, which if you're unfamiliar with that massacre, you probably do need to look that up just so you can become aware of just history in general. But she's looking for some footage that took place during that time. So she goes to Tokyo and encounters a man who had actually been there in person. And I don't really know where the story goes at that point. It could become very, I don't know, maybe guinea pig in a sort of way. I, I just... Uh, for, at that point, it's a blur, and I don't know what's going to happen. So this is definitely a book that's been on my radar for a while. I've heard people who enjoy disturbing books have enjoyed it. So, yeah, I'm not even going to look at the trigger warnings. I'm just going to let it assault me as it needs to. So, yep. Here we go. So following that is another book that I've heard is extremely disturbing. And while I am a huge fan of both movie adaptations of this book, I don't know why I haven't read this yet. But next up is Let Me In by John Avid Lindquist. And I have a good idea of what to expect about this as far as the disturbing aspects are concerned. I've heard that this is kind of like written in the style of what would happen if Anne Rice was a Swedish male. And for those of you who are completely unfamiliar with what to expect, the story regards two children, one of which is a female vampire, and the other one is a human male who gets bullied all the time. And eventually he becomes her provider and she becomes his protector. So that's the idea of it, but I hear that this is the really disturbing aspects come in with um, the female character's life as it details that she had actually been abused a great deal at her young age before becoming a vampire and then continuing to be abused because of her age. Um, I believe that the trigger warnings in this are probably going to be a lot of uh, sexual abuse. I, I'm only just kind of going on hearsay in that regards, but I do really enjoy this author. I've read another one of his books called Handling the Undead, if I remember the title correctly. It's a book I would like to revisit. It's not going to happen this time. But this author does write in a very beautiful way, and I know I will not be disappointed in this. Okay, so because I'm a sick and twisted bastard, the next book on the list is a book that I've heard is extremely disturbing, and it's something where if you plan to read it, you definitely need to check the trigger warnings in advance. I'm not going to do that because I just want to have my senses assaulted. But that is Dead Inside by Chandler Morrison. 
And from my understanding, this book is about a night shift security guard at the hospital who starts a romance with a doctor in the maternity ward. Both of them are sick and twisted perverts, and as their relationship grows, their sexual depravity gets to a no-limits area. So, I'm thinking this is probably going to be some human centipede Serbian level, Serbian film level sick shit. I, I just... <sighs> A lot of people ask why I do this to myself. I do it to myself because I'm bored with simple things. And since I'm talking about disturbing books, up next is Gods of the Dark Web by Lucas Mangum. Now, I've read his book, The Final Gate, which he had co-written with the author known as Wesley Southard. And after I read that book, I decided to stock up on a couple of their titles, which this was one that I chose by Lucas Mangum. And by the way, if you have not read The Final Gate, you really need to. I have a video uploaded on my deep dive on that book, and it's like a love letter to fans of Lucio Folky. So definitely check that video out, check the book out. It was a lot of gory fun. But as far as this work is concerned, from my understanding, it focuses on a young boy who has been doing protest. He's been fighting the good fight, but after a protest turns horribly wrong, he goes to the dark web for help. And I'm not exactly certain how the dark web is going to help in his circumstance, but I have heard that this falls into the subgenre of cosmic horror. Another book that I've wanted to read for a long time, and I don't know why I haven't, is The House Next Door by Anne River Siddons. Now, I understand this is the only horror book this author ever wrote. Other than this, she mostly focuses on romance. Not exactly certain how you get one horror book out of a romance author. I haven't really dove into that, but when I review this book, I'll definitely look it up a little bit more. And this is the Stephen King Horror Library Edition. There was only five books included in this series of the Stephen King Horror Library, which it took me years before I could get them all, but luckily I did, and I don't regret it. It was a lot of hardcore searching, but at last they all have a home together. And... From my understanding, this book is about a haunted house, but it is taken from the perspective of the neighbors who live next door, which I haven't really encountered that concept before, so I'm going to see exactly how a haunted house can live up to its fullest potential by just receiving the story from its neighbors. So, yeah. I've never read her before, and considering she writes romance now, and romance is not my genre, I kind of feel like this is going to be one of those books where I'm like, damn, I wish she could have produced more horror, but I will just take it for what it is, and of course I love a good creepy house story, I love a good ghost story, and I'm hoping this one will definitely make me sleep with the light zone. Another book that I intend to read is one that people have really either loved or hated. I haven't really heard of anyone saying that this was simply an okay book, but it is Nothing But Black Teeth by Cassandra Call. And from my understanding, this is about a group of friends who come together for a wedding and they decide that they are going to have a thrill-seeking adventure where they go to this abandoned house that is rumored to be haunted by a grotesque ghostly bride. And that, yeah, that's the concept. Uh, I've not read this author's full-length work before. I've read one of her short stories, which I really loved, and if this is anything like her short story that I read, in When Things Get Dark, I believe the anthology was. It's something that you're going to have to pay close attention to. There's going to be a lot of hidden Easter eggs. 
that aren't fully explained, but if you pick up the breadcrumbs here and there, you can form your own outcome, which I really hope that's what this book is going to do, because I really love that formula. But other than that, don't know what to expect. So that is only half of my to be read pile that I have set aside. But I'm going to upload another video next weekend that knocks out the other half of this. If you have read any of the books that I listed, please let me know what you thought about them. Try not to give me any spoilers. Uh, if I have talked about a book incorrectly, please let me know that my assumption and what I heard was completely wrong. But just don't tell me how I was wrong. I just want that to be a surprise. So now that we're at the end of this episode, I would like to move on to these wonderful people who have contributed to my Patreon account. As you can tell, some of the names listed here are creators, so be sure to check out their work. And if you would like to contribute to my Patreon account, I have a link available in the description section of this episode, where for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos. And if there is a certain profession you would like for me to tie to your name, just let me know and I'll do that. Also, I do have a $10 tier available, where for $10 a month, I'll still give you the shout out as you see here, but I do creepy photography on the side, so at the beginning of every month, I send out one of my creepy photos. From there, you can print it off and do whatever you like with it. So if you're able to do this, that's awesome. If not, no sweat. I just hope you return to this channel so we can continue to have a good time together. Also, if you would like to hit me up on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram are all available in the description section of this episode. Also, obviously, I have quite a few other videos coming in the near future, so be sure to subscribe to this channel and click that notifications bell.